Kingpin. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Actor John Amos in the house on the Let's Talk Under the Tree podcast. How you doing, sir? I'm doing just fine, sir. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. You are a living legend. So far, so good. It is what it is now. You're here now. <laughs> Amen. They haven't found me out yet. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> it is what it is, and I am glad to be interviewing you. First, I must say, I'm going to give you a shout out personally. I watched you growing up, and I never would have thought a country boy like me from South Carolina who was raised on a dirt road would interview you, and you gave me a shot, and I really appreciate that before I forget well, before you forget where you came from, let me remind you that we all came from the same dirt road. Might have had a different town calling, but we all know the grounds. It's familiar <laughs> territory to me, so I was comfortable with you from the jump. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. And we're going to get straight into this thing. You graduated from Colorado State, and I never heard of a lot of African Americans in your time that graduated from Colorado State. How was that time in America? Let me correct that before we get corrected via the internet or whatever. Okay. I never actually received my diploma from Colorado State. That is in the graduation ceremony. Later, I was to do social work in New York and receive credit work for it. I was working for an outfit called the Vera Institute of Justice. And I had a lot of firsthand experiences in the courtroom that I was able to uh, get credit for in terms of my education. So, in fact, uh, I was given the opportunity to receive an honorary doctorate from Drew University for my uh, social work, which is what I wanted to be. So, I just wanted to address that before some some knucklehead, you know, <laughs> called yeah. you and started bugging you about having made a mistake or a lie. You know, right. it's the truth. Right. You had an unusual path. You, pay, you played a little football, and I never knew that until a couple of weeks ago. I seen you on the broadcast talking about it, but I knew you were, you know, had, got a little athletic built. So speak about that experience when you played a little professional football, especially with the Kansas City Chiefs. You could put the emphasis on a little professional <laughs> football. I under contract uh, to my first team, which was the Denver Broncos. I took a tryout with them, a free agent tryout. I had written one of the coaches, uh, the late Ray Malavasi, and I told him, I said, I haven't had a very good career here at Colorado State, but if you would consider giving me a free agent shot, I'd be most appreciative of words to that effect. So in light of the fact that our, our, our training camp, or rather the Broncos training camp, was also our college campus, I didn't have far to travel to get to training camp. I walked around the block, literally, two blocks to my house to uh, the usual practice facility I'd been using, which the Broncos were now using. Right. My roommate, what was, what was ironic about that was I saw what was coming down the path for me in terms of my future. My roommate for the one night that I was there was Norman Bass, who was Dick Bass's brother. Dick Bass was all pro running back. Norman was for my money, just trying to coattail on Dick's fame, but he didn't make the Broncos either. But to cut to the chase, uh -huh. I had pulled a hamstring before I got to training camp. I couldn't even run the 40-yard dash for time. Now, here you got to do the lizard around the corner that's got to pull the hamstring. Get him out of here. He's eating somebody else's food, wasting our time. So I got cut in 24 hours. And uh, to this day, I, I am not a Broncos fan. I am a Kansas City Chiefs fan because <laughs> Hank Stram gave me two opportunities. He brought me to camp twice. Wow. And I got to see the world's most superlative athletes and realized that God must have had something else he wanted me to do, but football wasn't one of them. I mean, <laughs> with, with, after, they, after I looked and realized what they had at running back, Mac Lee Hill, uh, they called him the truck. Because when he'd get in his, in his stance before getting the handoff, he'd be winding up. Rum, rum, rum. And I think he weighed about 240, 245, about 5'10". Could run as fast as he wanted to and preferably over you. So there was Curtis McClinton, the strong boy from Kansas. I mean, Hank Stram had managed to recruit the finest athletes at every position imaginable. 
So my chances of making that team as a non Harold free agent were nil. And wow. that's when reality began to kick in. So I asked Coach Stram, I said, Coach, I know I'm going to be released. In fact, he had already called me into his office to give me that notice. I said, but there's something I'd like to do before I leave the team. He said, what's that, John? I said, would you object to my reading this poem that I've written? He said, what's it about? I said, it's called The Turk, which is that euphemism for the guy that comes and tells you it's over, get out of camp, <laughs> you know? Cut to the chase. He said, sure, why not? So I read the Turk to the entire team, rookies, veterans, high draft choices, free agents, all of them. It gave me a standing ovation. And at certain points in the poem, they got very serious because those were the moments that I reflected on what it's like to lose the opportunity and to realize that, no, you might be a good football player in high school, but this is the NFL. You, you Go home, son, and find something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I did, man. I had to focus on the gifts that God had given me, which was a, I was a compulsive performer, got kicked out of every school I ever went to for making jokes or cutting up or doing presentations at the wrong time. I mean, repeated periods of uh, suspension from East Orange High School, even though I was also a, a writer on and a cartoonist on the school newspaper. Yes. Uh, I was just a compulsive performer, and I couldn't help myself. And I, that was the first time I ever appeared on stage was in high school. Uh, they, that was the beautiful thing about going to a good high school in those days, and I, I, I stretch that point because my favorite people in the world are educators. And... We had a great liberal arts free, free program for students who wanted to be involved in various aspects of the dramatic arts. I chose to do my first play just because Mr. Wolverton, my history teacher, who was also a bit of a ham and an amateur actor, said, John Amos, would you like to do a, a, a play? I said, I don't know. What, what do I do? And he said, remember these words and say them when I tell you to. So I, I was playing the part of a prisoner, complete in striped uniform, myself and two other students. Actually, one was a student, the other one was a teacher, Mr. Wolverton. So we, it, was, it was a wonderful time because it was the first time I'd ever been on stage in a costume saying lines before an audience. And I think I had one line or two lines or something, but I got my first review. One of my buddies, Herbie Wilkes, one of my street running buddies, said when I came off the stage, he said, Amos, you sound like you were right out in the street, man. <laughs> and he was so taken back that I, I could do it and make it sound authentic that he had to express it. And that was a wonderful moment, my first review. Wow, that's a blessing. I'm going to take it back to the 70s. The average age of the viewers who's watching on here is about my age, say, uh, I would say 46 to 51. So we remember you from Roots. That's how... I, that's how I was introduced to you. John Thank Amos you. on Kunta Kinte. You know, Thank one of your fans on here, I'm going to play a little video. His name is Toby. And his mom looked at him and said, your name is going to be Toby from the cat. We appreciate you. We love you. And I'm sure that Mr. John Amos will answer your questions. Thanks, my brother. Thank you very much, Lee. All right, peace. <laughs> hey, Toby. If you're yes. still around, hey. <laughs> yes. You want to know about your boxing career? It was short-lived. Very <laughs> short-lived. I was a student at Colorado State University when I first became involved with the Golden Gloves in the state of Colorado. I'd done some amateur boxing prior to that. But I got serious about going into the Golden Gloves when I got to Colorado State University, and I lost half my football scholarship for – not performing as per the, the need for me to perform better. Cut to the chase. I said, well, I got to take this out on somebody and I got to stay in shape. So I uh, had one fight in the basement of the nearby Catholic church. And the, the boy I was fighting was not up to a, a prize fight that night. And I put him away in short order. And that got me egotistically thinking that I was going to be the next whoever but I was a knockout artist, you know. I took him out in something like 15 or 20 seconds in the first round. 
But the boy couldn't fight. The boy was scared to death of me. And of course, I was putting on all the boogeyman I could on. Wow. <laughs> you know, looking look like Joe Frazier or somebody. And then the next fight I had was against this Utah, uh, against the dude from Utah named Johnny Bullocks. And he was a, a white Mormon who was being trained by the Fulmer brothers. And um, I can't say I won the fight. I can't even say it was terribly close. He whipped my ass. OK, <laughs> I just took about a week for the swelling to go down. Wow. Seriously. You know, my, my, my eyes and, and shit was swelled up. <laughs> and I thought, I ain't doing this no more. I don't like this. You know, you end up, end up the days most with a bigger hat size than you had when you woke up. That's not good. Right. <laughs> I want to go back to Roots real quick. Yes, sir. You and Lewis, you and Lewis Garcia Jr., I think he played Fiddler. You played Kunta Kinte. Y'all played that thing, man. Oh, Lewis Gossett, you can see now why he's won the Academy Award, an Emmy, and a Grammy. I mean, Lewis Gossett is a consummate storyteller actor. To, but the thing that's so beautiful about him is he's so gracious. Like most of the fine actors, like the Denzels and a few others uh, that I've worked with, Martin Sheen, these actors have a certain gift, and it is a gift that they enjoy what they're doing and they will, they are giving actors. They, the camera, it's not just about them and the camera and how they look. They know it's an ensemble and it's a reciprocal deal when you're acting with another group or another individual. So it all works out, especially if you're working in something that's as well written as Roots was, that's predicated on history that you can relate to. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic vehicle. Acting is, if you don't, Take it too seriously. Right. The scene when the baby was hoisted up in the air, the story is told that it was very cold that night. And back in those days, you wouldn't, you know, the most diplomatic guy in the world. And No, I wasn't. I know the story. I know you what you're getting to, and it's true. I, I think it needs to be told. Yeah, well, this needs to be told. This was an infant, a baby, a young black child, and I'm a father and a grandfather. And it was very cold that night. The temperature had dropped. We were up in the mountains. And it called for the scene to be authentic to the point that the baby would be unwrapped from his blanket and held up. And then the words that go with the ceremony would proceed. Behold the only thing greater than yourself. It's a pivotal moment in the miniseries. However, when they were rehearsing with the baby, the director, who I shall not mention by name, was so insensitive to the fact that he was holding up a black child, an infant, to the elements. And he took so long in deciding how the shot was going to be shot. Meanwhile, the temperatures hadn't gotten any warmer. The baby's still unwrapped. So I lost it, if he, or rather I found it. I told him, I said, if you don't wrap that baby up and, and, and do right, I'm going to come down there and cut your ass. I don't work to that effect. I mean, I made it plain. There was a baby, there was an infant at risk. And I said that as a grandfather, I can't remember the exact threat, but I made it plain that I, I was threatening his life. If he was threatening the baby's life, somebody go stand up for this child. And um, that's the way I felt at the time. I, I, and it might've cost me some goodwill buttons or mad badges or a couple of checks even with the studio or whomever. I didn't give a rat's but. It was about time to speak up for that baby. And that's what I'm loving about what's happening right now. The realities of the conditions in our country are calling for people to speak up. Now they can do it a lot more diplomatically than I was inclined to do in those days when I was younger. But the bottom line is, you are, we gotta stand up. It's over. All this amelioration and saying the polite words to get the chains off your neck or to get the knee off your neck right you know what I'm saying to hell with diplomacy get the message out there we ain't taking it no more end of story amen I'm going to move on to um, the good times a lot of individuals in my age group they were scared of you with the character James Evans <laughs> that you played real talk it was just a character we couldn't it tell was, <laughs> it was just a character I, try, I tried to show through James Evans the kind of discipline that is called for today that was, it was just the normal back in the day. 
You know, when you, your father told you something or that, that man of the house or that woman of the house told you something. In my case, it was my mom uh, for the most part of my life. They said, oh, don't, don't do that again. And told me what the repercussions were going to be very vividly and graphically if I were to do that again. And it's called for today, but like I said, it's virtually non-existent. Why we have so, and that's why we have so many problems amongst our youth. Right. Lack of direction. Right. When you were killed off the show in good times, it was a sad day in America, believe it or not, especially me watching your show as a young, you know, young adult. Everybody was just kind of crying, even though it was a you know, a TV show, but mm. we looked at you as a real life character because the style of acting that you guys did back then was so surreal. You couldn't tell me that that was just acting. We looked at you, John and Mr. Character, also James Evans as the same person. <laughs> well, you have to remember Esther Rowe brought authenticity to her role as the mother of that family because Esther was one of, I think, 13 or 16 children. She said she had her first pair of shoes when she turned 13. So she knew deprivation at a real level that no Hollywood writer could possibly ever convey through his own experience, what she had felt and experienced as a woman and as a black woman during those times. And she was out of Florida. And I'll tell you how real it was. We met off camera and away from the studio one day to collect our unemployment. That's how real the situation was. We had shot the pilot, but we were waiting as so many actors did after they'd done a pilot in those days, that period of time, perhaps two to three weeks, maybe as long as two months, to find out what the success and how well your pilot had tested. That would be the determining factor as to whether or not you were a, you were a successful actor in a successful series. When we got the word, uh, when, we got the, when we started the countdown for the, the deliberation by the network, we were both collecting unemployment mm. on, at McCadden Place, which is, was the traditional place where unemployed actors or actors out of work even temporarily go to collect their unemployment. We met there as, as fate or God would have it. We had the same visiting day to pick up our checks. So I'm, there I am on one side of the fence waiting to go in and Esther comes out with her check, <laughs> having just been there. And we start talking, but we didn't start talking about, the, you know, the uh, anything other than the business side. And I told her, I said, let me break this down to you. Because she had not done a television series before. And by that time I'd done and written and maybe a half a dozen different series. And I said, they're gonna be looking to divide us. They're gonna be looking to split us up, turn you against me, me against you. Because that'll keep, and there won't be anything personal. Don't take it personal. It'll just be their way of keeping the negotiation leverage down. Because if we team up and they show we show that we're united, we've got more leverage. Right. And as I told you, this was her first television experience after Maud, and she proven her, that she could carry an audience and a large demographic on Maud. So I said, I will be, uh, I'll be the the loud mouth that complains about everything and the muscle and the, you know, I, I'll get mad from time to time. You be the lady and give them a safe option, which was a natural role for her because she was a natural diplomat. I mean, so we had a wonderful chemistry, a wonderful teamwork, and it went on to become eminently successful. And the introduction of JJ was, was a needed element, the writers felt, but I always contended that they'd lost the family when they added and put too much emphasis on the comedic. So we came to a part in the ways uh, I was ultimately released from the show. I was released in the form of a phone call, but Norman Lear is such a genius and such a creative entity. We won't realize his, his importance to the medium of television. I don't think in our lifetimes, he changed the medium. He yeah. cut, to, cut to the chase. We were to work together again another four or five times. You know, it, I got fired, hired, fired, rehired. It was a tumultuous relationship, but it was one that was predicated on honesty. I was honest with him, and he was honest with me. When there were lines that came up that I didn't believe a black man would say under those economic conditions, having lived them, 
I would tell them, I said, no, I, I wouldn't say that. And the writers would get incensed, some of whom had never had any experience or relationships with a person of color before in their life. And I said, this ain't flying. It ain't working. Wow, that's a blessing. You did, you did that thing, brother. Well, that's, it was easy to do. It was me. It was you. It was it was your daddy. It was your uncles. I said, I, oh, this, I'll be the expert on this. Yes. I don't want no second guesses on how he would have done if J.J. got shot or if, or if, if some dude abused Thelma. It's time to correct some bad habits. Right. right. Norman Lay is an older gentleman these days. Uh, in his older age, do you think he's a more humble person because he's in his 90s now? I don't know if he's humble. I think Norman is 98 now. We worked together most recently in the Good Times recapitulation. Uh, and ironically enough, I got to play opposite myself, wow. or at least the characterization of myself as portrayed by Andre Brower, an actor that I have tremendous respect for. But it was really a, a surrealistic moment. It was like the Twilight Zone. There I am playing a crooked politician, playing opposite James Evans, in the James Evans apartment, and there's Andre Power, an actor I respect and have worked with in the past in the stage, but he's got the chops. He's dressed and looked exactly like I did and doing me. It was like working opposite yourself. So it went very well. Uh, the audience was most pleased, and I was pleased as Norman was after the, uh, the audience response. It was a great, great moment in my career. I'm going to touch on the Cosby show just for a little bit. I know you did some work with the Cosby show. I've interviewed a few actors and all of them have said that uh, Bill Cosby, he doesn't like cussing, but that's pretty much established, you know, from how he does his comedy. And it's also also been established that he's sort of like an arrogant type of guy, sort of like on the set or off the set that he thinks he's, you know, um, above people slightly. Could you kind of touch on that a little bit? I worked, I had the pleasure of working with Bill, of course, in the film. Uh, let's do it again, along with the immortal and immortal, like he's, but he's still here. I mean, but the, the, the Sidney Poitier, uh, Harry Bella, I mean, it, it was just a wonderful time in black filmmaking. And so we were, I worked together with him on that film and he had me cracking up and laughing. And then later I was to do a couple of episodes, I think, on the Cosby show where he played my doctor, my physician. Right. And um, I will say this. I will say I don't care how he is judged by others who think that he might be arrogant or whatever. The man was an image at that time before his downfall for the disgraceful aberrations of his private life. Uh he was something to behold. I mean, he was something to emulate in terms of his success. But like so many that have success, they start thinking that they, they are impervious to society's rules and to the laws that govern mankind's behavior. And he started treating women like sexual objects and paid the price, end of story. Okay, cool. Let's get into coming to America a little bit. I think the first shot was uh, what filming about what thirty years ago, approximately. Coming to America, yeah, thirty years ago. Yeah, yeah. you it's were amazing uh, how fast time flies, yeah. but it flies, brother. You was Mister Cleo McDowell at that time. It was a lot of aspiration and hope that a lot of African Americans could, you know, have a business, even though that was film, you know. But you played the part that was a positive image for African-Americans only in a business. And we want to thank you for that. Even though it was film and it was, you know, a movie, but you played the character so strong, everyone actually believed that they can have a business because of that role. Well, that was the idea to play the role convincingly. And, and it, again, I took it from real life because I'd been a McDonald's employee, having worked the first McDonald's unit in all of Canada which was located in Vancouver, British Columbia. After I got cut from the BC Lions at last football team, I needed a job. I had a baby girl. I got a job at McDonald's, and I started as a trainee peeling piles of potatoes. <laughs> you know, in those days, they gave you real potatoes, and you could peel them and wash them and wash the extra. Then it was it was an education in fast food. So I was there on the ground floor of fast food McDonald's 
in Vancouver, BC. It was an experience. Right. And later I get to play it for a few more dollars as Cleveland McDowell. Right. <laughs> Moving right along to Come in America too. Uh, my correct, it was filmed at Tyler Perry Studios. Right. Right. How was that experience? Because man, that's a hell of a studio right there. To drive up to the Tyler Perry Studios after my career, or at this point in my career, knowing what we had gone through in the 60s with the exploitation films and being literally told, you better not try and drive through the front gate of this studio or that studio. There were some studios you had to go around the back. Right. They didn't want you to be seen coming in the front like the regular actors. So cut to the chase, to drive up to the Tyler Perry Studios, I was at a loss as to how, what would I say to this man to let him know how much he's appreciated, not just by myself, but by a multitude of actors, black and white and Asian and Native Americans and the whole nine yards because of what he has shown that through his very tenacity and his talent, he rose to have his own studio, not just a job. And he didn't invest his hard earned, well received and earned money in the latest toy. He built a studio which could hire and did. And I saw literally thousands of people and changed thousands of lives. At one point in my career, when I was less sensitive, I was asked by uh, Oprah, she, somehow the question came up about whether or not I would work with or for, or did I like Tyler Perry's work? And at that time, all I, was, all I had seen of his work was the Medea character. And I questioned his choice at this time of so much ambivalence in the black community about right. sexuality. Right. And I said, I don't know if we, that's, I, I, well, I agree that we need the freedom to do what we need to do. And she said, if you could see what it, the impact that he's having, well, I have seen the impact he's having now. The amount of lives that he has changed for the better and the amount of artists that he's given an opportunity to, extras, makeup, this one, that one, Academy Award winners, the whole nine yards. He's a bad man. <laughs> he's a bad man. It's a little story that Eddie Murphy kind of tricked you on set. You know how he changed into those characters and you got kind of out of whack a little bit and you were kind of fooled and bamboozled. Could you let everybody know about that incident? <laughs> I won't mind letting them know about it because this this is the further proof of Eddie Murphy's mercurial talent. I'm on a break and I'm standing outside on the break just enjoying the California sunshine. And some dude comes up to me and he says, Hey, I say, Yes, sir, can I help you? So he just looked like a regular street dude. And I said, I can I help you. He said, Yeah, man. He said, uh, who are you? I said, What? He said, Who are you? I said, oh, my name's John. John Amos. He said, I never heard of you, but look, where are they doing this Eddie Murphy movie at? So I said, well, over on lot, whatever studio we were assigned to. And he said, yeah, I'm going to go over there and see, can I see Eddie Murphy? So he said, what you do? I said, I'm an actor. He said, what you acting in? I said, I'm acting in that Eddie Murphy movie you're talking about. He said, what'd you say your name was? I said, John, John Amos. I said, hey, look, man, excuse me. I ain't trying to blow you off or nothing, but I'm on my break. I'd like to just relax for a while. Oh, you want me to get out your face, huh? <laughs> Come to find out, no, I'm going to swell up. I'm getting ready. I'm debating whether or not to drop him with a left or a right. And Eddie starts laughing. It's Eddie with the prosthetic makeup on for, for uh, uh, what was it, the singer? Oh, um, sexual chocolate or something. Sexual like that. chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't recognize him. I'd never seen the makeup before. And the makeup could not be spotted with the human eye up close, much less a camera. I mean, I said, whoa, no wonder Rick Baker won the Academy Award. But Eddie got me that day. He started laughing. Eh, eh, eh. He laughs like a mule in heat, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a different type of laugh. Um, your son is a bad man also. Yes. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Let's talk about that a little bit. He's a film director. He kind of took after you a little bit. Let's talk about him. He's a bad man. His name is Case, right? KC, AC. initials KC, which stand for Kelly Christopher. Okay. In fact, he was in the back room, but he, he was taking a nap because we worked late, late last night okay. on film and different things. So, yeah, go ahead and ask me questions. I'd be proud to speak on him. I'll do an infomercial on him. 
Yeah, what is he what is he working on right now? I know you guys are working on something together, but he's a bad man, I must say. Right now, I would say the number one thing on our mutual and respective agenda is a biopic on my life and career. Good. And Casey, of course, being a graduate of Cal Arts in Valencia, one of the finest film schools in the country, is prepared. Pardon us. That's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. At any rate, uh, he's producing it. We're writing it together. He'll do the editing and everything else as regards to post-production. But that's what we're working on, pardon me, amongst other projects. Um, my mother's maiden name was West. Right. Right now I'm working with a young producer out of Atlanta, Charles West. And he's got his own studios, and I would say he's a, he's a comer. He's going to be a force in the industry very shortly, and I intend to join forces with him to to – help him make that happen. Um, but ask me further questions before I digress too much, sir. Okay. You can. <laughs> Did you know your son wanted to be like you, I would say, as a kid? Because you have so many kids that you actually, besides your own biological kids, you were a role model too. Believe it or not, it's a lot of kids that did not have fathers. And you just don't know the impact. Because I'm reading a lot of the comments. I can't even post all of them. That even though you was on the screen, your character um, came alive with a lot of individuals, you know, and you were actually their real father on the screen. And I'm sure your son can appreciate that also. Like, and like I was saying earlier, you're a legend now. It is what it is. I thank you. I'm sure Mike, well, we have a good relationship as a filmmaker. He's a, he's a visual storyteller mm -hmm. and we have combined our energies and our love and respect for the craft, for the what what the uh, filmmaking process can can do for you, the artist, but also what it can do for that public that you want to reach, especially in these times when there's so much misinformation, right. or disinformation out there. We, it like for example, the bombing of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is just now being brought to the public's attention. Yes. But in the back rooms of slave quarters, not slave quarters so much, but in, of tenements and buildings and homes throughout the United States, especially in the Deep South, we knew about that. Yes. that. That was the history that was talked about that was kept on the down low. We knew they had flown planes with bombs and incendiaries into that area and dropped them and burned up people, burned up their homes, destroyed whole neighborhoods, businesses. My own family was affected by it. I mean, I come from a family of mercantile. I got a mercantile heritage. My aunts and uncles, my great aunts and uncles owned stores, businesses, beauty parlors in, the, in some parts of the world that have been bombed, raised to the ground. So I know all that, and I have the concomitant anger that goes with having had that knowledge, but also the knowledge and the wisdom and the, that comes and the peace that comes from knowing that this too shall pass and is passing. Also, Finally, reparations and the whole nine yards are being discussed for those that were murdered right. and buried. Also, mm -hmm. with the, the Tulsa incident, I watched the uh, program on CNN last night. They actually dug up some mass graves with bodies. Right. Wow, that's sad, man. Very sad, but when you think about the millions that were dropped in the ocean on the way here to the slave. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. It's, it, it's a repetition of the same inhumane crimes. And at some point, I hope in man's history and man's lifespan on this planet, because he's not going to be here forever. That's a fact. Yes. Um, that we learn something because we're all just passing through. We only yeah. all get to stay a hot second. If you think you're going to be here forever and you're really going to use up all them long playing records, you can forget it. Right. What keeps you going? I mean, guys your age that's in acting, you know, they're pretty much retired. What keeps you going? Because you pretty much look the same. I mean, it's no difference. What keeps you going? Special effects. <laughs> <laughs> that could be special effects, but what the hell else could it be? No, I, I have a penchant for the foods that make me feel good. And <laughs> I have a cook. She, uh, This woman can work wonders with the most simplest fare, you know, 
I mean, and I like my simple foods. I also like some African cuisine, but I really love some lima beans, some neck bones, some greens, some cornbread. Oh yeah. Okay, give me that. Sure, I can I can eat frog legs and a whole bunch of other you know hummingbird tongue and all that rare that delicacy. That don't make, that don't make no boo boo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I got to have something to eat, man. We got work to do out here, and I got to have a man's meal. Right. I know your father was a mechanic. Do you think that you got some of your talents from your father from being so creative? I would think that my creativity comes from my dad and from my mom. Now, my mom was a very creative person. She we had to be at 5'11 and a half. And um, wow. being a very, very young mother, she had a child while she was still a child. That would be my, my sister. And then, well, I've been blessed to have a mom like that because she was a very resourceful woman, extremely resourceful. Annabelle Amos out of Birmingham, Alabama. Right. But everybody was resourceful out of Alabama in those days. So she was she was one of a multitude of unique human beings, strong spiritually and the whole nine yards. So I'm the recipient and of all those blessings that she had, she passed on to me, plus some knowledge, Boku knowledge. That's a blessing. Yes, it is. I always ask this one question. I'm going to see if you're going to um, answer exactly like the other actors. You might have already worked with him. I'm not sure. But if it's that one actor that you would like to work with or have worked with, who would that be? Only one. Only one? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I give you two. Denzel Washington. God, dog. It. That's it. <laughs> yes. Why? Because we worked together on stage where I portrayed his father. And we worked together in film where I portrayed his father. So there is a a believable father and son link there. Um, I had a wonderful time with him on stage. He is the he is the most gifted, instinctive actor I've ever worked with in my life, but also the, the best prepared. Denzel leaves nothing to chance. We're doing a play called Split Second in which he was playing a traumatized officer who had shot an innocent felon or suspected felon, and now is trying to cover up and don't know what to do. So he goes to his father, myself, my character's name is Rusty. Rusty's a t retired police officer from the old days in Pittsburgh when he too had to kill a man. But the killing he did was justified because the, the dude he killed, along with three other men, were, try were attempting to beat him to death with two by fours. He drew his pistol and said, not tonight. So that that made it easy for me to work with the Denzel who was so prepared. He went to the academy, the police academy, and interviewed and found out what it's like to be an officer and how does it traumatize the officer. And the next day, we, and he was kind enough and gracious enough as an actor, and this was the most gracious thing I'd ever seen, to inform me who was doing the dialogue with him, that he'd been to the academy, found out a reaction, and be ready. That's all he said. I said, okay. So that night we did our usual play, well, it, the way we rehearsed it. And when it came time to convey to the audience that he, in fact, had shot and killed an unarmed innocent and the impact it was having, Denzel, the actor collapsed on stage and began to weep. Tore it out of me, but I, I held my character and I said, get up, boy, get up! <laughs> Damn it. Those years of being JJ's daddy, you ain't got no son of mine's gonna curl up on the floor like a wimp. Get up! And yeah. he, he stayed in character. It was a moment. The audience, I wish you could see that play. I wish I could do anything on stage with Denzel Washington again. And you called for two, right? That, he, he's the only one that comes to mind, man, that right. does it all. Right. All you actors say the exact same thing. Everyone that I have interviewed say Denzel. He's on my bucket list. You was on my bucket list. Eddie Murphy's on my bucket list. And our oh, same and Eddie, list. in terms of his youth. Now, Denzel doesn't do that much comedy. Right. But I say those are two genres that should be separated. If an actor's mission is to come into a room of strangers, and make them believe the illusion that he's creating 
And that illusion is primarily dramatic. Hands down is Denzel Washington. If it's comedy and you want that audience laughing, hands down, it's Eddie Murphy. He makes these seamless transitions we take for granted watching. Look at the nutty professor. And look, look at how vulnerable that character is. I mean, you, you feel sorry for him, but at the same time, you're laughing your butt off at it. I mean, he's, he's, I told him when we first worked together, I said, you, you got it. You got the gift, man. You, <laughs> you got the gift. The last thing that I have, you know, when we get older, we, you know, lose our memory a little bit. So when you, you know, memorizing your lines, are you having any trouble in your old age or you just, Make something up, make something up as you go and go along with it. Fill it in. Well, I can't make it up as I go because that that's not professional and that would throw everybody off their mark as regards to their particular assignments in the film. Right. But yeah, it, it becomes more difficult because I've had over 50 years of scripts, projects, TV, movies, stage. It can get uh, it can get forgettable, you know. So sometimes I go into the memory banks and uh, the room is closed. <laughs> oh man right well it's been a pleasure mr amos hey god bless you my brother hey you're a living legend well thank you for the opportunity i hope all your viewers out there will take it take the time to see my latest work which is a, a film i did in florida during the height of the pandemic everybody had to wear a mask etc right. called um because of Charlie. Right. And it's, again, it's a story that's somewhat synonymous with my life. It's about a dysfunctional family that comes together and pulls together and survives a natural hurricane, which is threatening all of them. And um, Because of Charlie is a film that should be seen. In fact, right here in West Cliff, Colorado, I've become a member of the board on the Jones Theater and I'll be doing a fundraiser here using Because of Charlie as the uh, attracting vehicle and just get folks to come out and watch a movie and um, enjoy themselves. And I'm sure I can talk to my friend Willie here about <laughs> doing a retake on the meal I'm about to enjoy. He's doing ribs. And this brother is from Kansas City. So uh -oh. I don't know for that because he's an ex-chief lover. <laughs> I mean, he still loves the Chiefs, but right. the bottom line is he's doing ribs, potato salad, baked beans, Right. Right. right now it's waiting for me. So I'm going to see you in a minute unless you've got something comparable on your menu. <laughs> the last comment I'm going to go over is um, someone said, God bless. And they're still scared of you because of that character, James Evans. And they're 60, about 60 years old. Just, you know, with just a little compliment. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm most appreciative. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Amos, he's a famous actor. And I'm going to give you a shout out one more time. I said it at the beginning, at the beginning. I thank you for letting me interview you. I never would dream in a million years a little country boy like me who watched you on TV, came off a dirt road in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, would get a shot to interview you. And I watched you as a little boy. And I and I thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Are we just two country boys having a little dialogue over the back fence? That's, <laughs> that's right. And thanks for it. You know, oh, yeah. Now, you had asked me about my son earlier. Yeah, go ahead. You need to check out some of his work on Casey Amos Filmmaker on tick TikTok. CaseyAmosFilmmaker dot com. Casey dot Filmmaker dot com on TikTok. On TikTok. Casey want to show his face. Okay, okay. He, I, I don't mind he show his face. Tell he can come around if he want to do it. Come on, if he if he wants to, it don't bother me. It's all good. Let me tell you yourself. Since there I got you go. Come on, man. If you want to get an update on what we're up to, just go to a TikTok and hit KC.Filmmaker and you can check us out. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Y'all look, look like so much, brother. You're right. All stay, on, to you. all right stay on for about 60 seconds. Remember, we're going to do a surprise phone call for about 30 seconds, if you don't mind. I'll hang on. Okay, I'll hang on real quick. Thanks, everyone, for watching the Let's Talk Under the Tree podcast. I'm Mr. P, Mr. John Amos. We had a good time. One time for your mind, two times for your soul, and wear your mask. If you don't want to wear your mask, as I always say, that's your business, and we out of here. Kingpin Music.